Welcome to our wonderful review for Words of Radiance and I wish that I had done this the first time through because there's some things I'm like did I notice that the first time? It kind of seems obvious but maybe I didn't notice it the first time. The Stormlight Archive takes place on the world of Roshar within the Cosmere. This is a world where high storms are very prevalent and in these high storms it carries pretty much life energy besides just rains and well destruction because they are very destructive they throw things around that people don't survive really if they're outside in high storms that is actually a way of execution it's, or if you've managed to survive then you know you're pardoned because obviously the storm father wanted you to live like Kaladin. either way though the energy from this powers gemstones which provide light which provide ingenuity through the fabrials of the world like spanries which are pins that can be connected to right across the world pretty much right do they have they also have relay stations I don't, but i do believe across any distance where if they're connected they will write across a piece of paper for you what and you can have real time pretty much conversations with somebody. Gemstones occur pretty much in nature but they are uncut and they have to be smoothed, formatted, smalled to be able to fit in devices and work. And one of the places that they get them from are these very very large creatures that are found out at the shattered plains where the war is going on. The chasm fiends there have what is called gem hearts and they are generally pretty large. They could grow up to the size of like a person's head, I believe, within them. And this powers feeding the army. This powers paying for things. Gemstones are also, chips of them are used as like currencies. And they are also used for something else. The stormlight that comes from the high storms and makes the gemstones glow and power the fabrials also can be used in the form of magic, which is the surge binding. Oh, what to say, that's not a spoiler. Surge binders can use the stormlight to be able to do things. And there is specific reason they can do this, and but we can't still dive into it much without getting into spoilers, besides knowing that the stormlight is a natural force and it powers one half of the magic system that people are just now discovering back in this world because 4,000 years since the last desolation everything that they have known and relearned really through to this point is a bit different and there are several things that were lost or just considered myths and without a certain key aspect it allowed humanity to forget because without this key aspect it wasn't even possible and it's finally becoming possible again and you don't find out for most of the book so I can't say it Lots of weird cuts in this one as I'm trying to piece myself around the spoilers that I'm trying not to say and then I might have accidentally said so I'm going to keep cutting them out. Our characters though, in this one we are still going to be following multiple characters but more and more of them are in the same location at least. So our main location is also the Shattered Plains. Why? I don't know why I said that. Dalinar Colin, we shall start with him and his plot. Dalinar's visions that we were told about in the last book have kind of slowed down and stopped. Sometimes there are repeating visions and they do not come up as much in this book. They're not as prevalent of a role. What Dalinar is trying to do though is bring the high princes together, make them stop just like going to get money on their own in these chasm runs and instead work together towards the common goal of fulfilling the vengeance pact for his brother being killed and just ending the war. He is doing this by making them work together, making them actually respect and follow the king's orders, which does not help much. Dalinar and Sadius are still on opposite ends and they are actively arguing and splitting half of the high princes of who will listen and who won't. And Dalinar comes up with a plan to force their compliance and force them to do this by using Adolin. And you actually get to see through Adolin's perspective quite a bit more in this one. And it is interesting because Adolin is kind of much more of a happy person and he seems kind of carefree except for these huge worries of course that he does have for his father that you saw through the first book. 
Then there is the scene at the end of the book, like, oh my god. Kaladin is probably our second biggest character in this book. I feel like we definitely see from Kaladin more than Dalinar. Kaladin is going through this big change as now he has been saved from being a slave and he works for Dalinar now. He's actually a captain of Dalinar's personal guard. I think we were told that at the end of the first book. While you would think now Kaladin doesn't have to worry quite so much about his men and staying alive, no, Kaladin is taking like this whole world problem on his shoulders similar to Dalinar and Dalinar's visions of the prophecies, not prophecies, but his visions of like things to come. So Dalinar feels the weight of the world and trying to save everybody on his shoulders. And Kaladin feels the weight of he has to save all the bridge crews, and not just bridge four, but all of the bridge crews. Everybody's his responsibility. He has to make sure everybody's safe. He has to make sure Dalinar's safe. He has to make sure the king's safe. He has to make sure Adolin's safe. Him and Adolin, oh my gosh, it's not frenemies. They're totally not friends. And they're not quite enemies, but the bickering and the animosity there while also kind of respecting each other, neither of them almost don't trust each other either. Kaladin doesn't trust hardly any light eyes though. And that becomes a big problem in this book and something he has to work through as he has to question what is the right thing to do as he, you know, is supposed to be a person of honor and fight for honor. What is the right thing to do? That is Kaladin's big question and big struggle in his depression as he's fighting with that through the book and you actually see this come out towards aspects of his friends too as he doesn't want to go out. He's too work oriented in, at certain points when it is pulling and dragging him down and he's not pee, being his usual hope for self or helping people. They see this sadness and it affects other people too as it drags their mood down. Our other major player, with the one that we will get the backstories for in this one, is Shalon. And Shalon shines. You got to see her growing from this country girl who's never been out in the world in the first book to this book, having to completely change and adapt to her situations. In the beginning of the book, Yasna and Shalon are heading toward the Shattered Plains. They're on the wind's pleasure again, which is the fact that I completely forgot that that was the ship that was carrying her to the Shattered Plains. And I'm sorry, that's, um, I'm not gonna spoil it anymore just to know that. And just Shalon coming into herself, trying to be like Yasna who projects this outward air of confidence even when she's not, projects this air of authority. Yasna even tells her, you have the authority that you believe you have. You Other people will treat you the way that you project. And Shalon tries to embody this through the whole book which will be something that comes back though later down the line. In her flashbacks though, you see what made Shalon into the girl that we met in Carbranth, what drove her to this, how she is able to be so witty and so this and yet so timid and uh, nervous on the inside in why she does this. I really also wanna talk about the interactions of Shalon and a specific but I can't because that's like, oh, it happens in the first chapter. I can say it, but it doesn't. It doesn't happen in the first chapter and that sucks. Other characters, you will see from Zeth again in the interludes as you continue to find him and Teravangian on the path set from the first book that I completely forgot that that was the end of the first book as we move forward. And then there is Eshenai. Eshenai is a Parshendi. She was actually one of the first to meet Gavilar and Delinar before everything happened. And you see current day Eshenai and the Parshendi city, what is left from them, how that is going, and just the complete change and what the Alethi think of what's happening with the Parshendi and what their side is actually like. And that is always incredible when you get to see from both. Our plot, though, is moving forward on the Shattered Plains, the Alethi, trying to actually fight a unified battle or get to the point to maybe they can fight a unified battle. Shalon is trying to continue Yasna's work of finding the city of Eurythiru and the answers to the Voidbringers so that there is not a desolation again. To get everyone convinced, to be at the Shattered Plains and find the information to find this lost city, Kaladin is trying to just keep everyone together and safe. 
while coming to grips with how his life is now. One other character that you actually get to see from a few times that I don't think we got to in the first book is Sadius. In his chapters, he's a very selfish, goal-oriented person. Just, no, he does not care about the greater except to be a power. There's a few other ones, of course, always. There is one in the interludes, which we'll come back to in another book that's important, kind of. She comes back, at least. We'll go with that. I feel like I've babbled and rambled on about this review, but I checked my notes and I did touch on everything that's there. It just might have been an incoherent way of getting there. When I ran this through Copal, this was yet again like a 4.5. I don't, I don't know myself anymore. I don't know how we didn't get to five stars. I thought it was five stars the first time I read it. I don't know what I'm doing anymore. I hope that you did enjoy this review, however it came about. I'm sorry if there were the weird cuts as I, you know, try to keep myself from saying spoilers. I hope though that you will stick around for more. You will read these series, read these series, read these books as well if you haven't yet or I'm encouraging you to pick them up because they're great. There's so, so much history and world building into these books which I did not touch on in this one because we weren't we weren't given a much more information as the first book we got a lot but without spoilers I can't go into it as much in this one because we are given more magic-y information here in this one and information but spoilers but the next one also expands so much so we will get to that I hope you're having an awesome day though and finding something great to read. See you in the next one.